Kohler Smart Toilets introduce a new standard of design and cleanliness, sculptural forms, intuitive technology, and total personalization with integrated warm water cleansing, heated seats, and warm air dryers. For peace of mind and convenience, there are touchless lids, seats, flush, and a self-sanitizing bidet wand. Now you can even use voice commands with Numi 2.0, featuring built-in Amazon Alexa. Explore the complete lineup at Kohler.com slash Smart Toilets and discover what you've been missing. Introducing the second best buffalo thing, Cheetos Crunchy Buffalo. Nothing beats buffalo wings on game day, but with a tangy and cheesy buffalo flavor, Cheetos Crunchy Buffalo is proud to be the second best buffalo thing. Grab Cheetos Crunchy Buffalo today. McDonald's presents Burger Reviews by Hamburglar. Today's review, the classic Big Mac, Hamburglar. Rubble, rubble. He said, there's more sauce in every bite. Bada ma ba ba. Rubble. Available at most restaurants in this area. When it comes to teaching kids and teens about money, practice makes perfect. That's where Greenlight comes in. With a debit card and money app of their own, kids learn to earn, save, spend wisely, and invest. Parents send instant money transfers, create custom chores, and automate allowance, while kids track their spending, set savings goals, and practice money skills they can use today and for life. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast. How's it going and welcome to episode 79 of On The Wire, proud member of the Pitcherless Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at OnTheWirePod. Of course, if you're listening on a platform that allows ratings and reviews, please take a second to let us know what you think. I am Adam Howe. You can follow me on the Twitter at 80Grade. That's all spelled out. And once again, joined by my co-host Kevin Hastings, who should be followed on the Twitter at Hasting Kevin. And this is it. Kevin. We made it. I mean, we got one. We got to spend the rest of our money tonight. I get it. We got to go through the process. We still have one more process to go through, but we made it. We were just talking <laughs> before <laughs> before we started recording about how the last two or three weeks or even two or three months have not been kind to a few of our teams, but which are you looking, are you paying attention more to a particular league or two in either whether it's today, Sunday or through the last three to four games of the season? Honestly, I'm still a, I, 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 I'm crazy. I'm still paying attention to all of them. There, I, throughout the year in the leagues that were doing well and have fallen off, I'm scrambling just to try to get back to a certain point, whatever that point may mm-hmm. be. I, this is my second year in the NFBC on auction championship. And I was at the bottom for a very large point part of the season. And I've scrambled till I'm exactly mid pack. I'm eighth out of 15 teams. I'd really like to get just one more spot sure. so I can say I'm top half. Technically I'm not top half yet. So I have a benchmark in every league that I'm trying to get to and a couple of head to head leagues with a, a day and a half to go as we're recording on Saturday that are undecided. A couple of roto so leagues with the three days left that are undecided. It's, it's crazy. I have stressful baseball for the next four and a half days. That, and it's the best and the worst at the exact same time. It's like when it all comes down to Sunday night in a head to head playoff matchup. And I joked about it last Sunday when. The, uh, the Red Sox-Yankees game got got uh, rained out. Oh, and yes. Both, I saw both that. Nestor Cortez Jr. and Brian Bayo got complete games. Obviously, Cortez also got the shutout. But if your playoff matchup, w- you won your playoff matchup because you streamed Brian Bayo and he gave you a complete game because of the rain out, that is head-to-head playoff baseball. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So it, we'll see what insane. we'll see what the the Mets in Atlanta do for us, this right? Week. <laughs> we'll see how that because there out. there has been a little bit of rain down in the southeast. I just a little heard. bit, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, our hearts go out to all those who are affected by that. Of course, a friend of the show Yankee Eaton is as front and center in our minds on that. So hopefully, everybody down there is doing as well as as well as possible. We hear that Yancey is safe. Yancey and his family are safe. He had to be displaced a little bit. Hopefully he comes back to his home and everything is uh, is salvageable and uh, nobody's hurt. Let you know what, like I said, Kevin, we're, we, we've, we did it. We're 159 games in. 
We've got anywhere between three and four games left, depending on the team that you're following. A lot can happen. We get that, whether it's three stolen bases from your catcher on on a weekend, as we saw. Or Kyle uh, Schwarber. Or or crazy week for him. (laughs) But... We brought in a guest today that I'm sure is hoping that does not happen. Nothing major swings happened in the last couple of days as he currently sits at the top of our On The Wire Listener League overall standings. I'm very grateful to have with us today Dennis Timko, who he took part in our second league, which I believe, you can both correct me, you both are in this league, I'm not in this one, drafted back in November, maybe December. So beef, I know it was before the new year hit. And he's well on his way to winning that league, that second league and doing everything he can to hold on to the first ever on the wire overall championship as the NFBC platform puts on our standing. That prize for that is a lovely YooHoo shower. So you can look forward to videos of whoever ends up taking that home, going out to the 7-Eleven, grabbing a YooHoo and uh, videotaping that for us. That would be amazing. But we're gladly going to pick Dennis's brain about what he credits his success here and his overall thoughts on the league. But for now, Dennis, man, thanks for joining us. How's it feel? How's it going? It feels pretty good. Thanks for having me on the show. This was an exciting, pleasurable invitation here. So I'm excited to talk to you guys. So I've been playing fantasy baseball since high school. I'm 48 years old, so probably around 1991. I made a really bad trade my first season in fantasy baseball. Traded away Roger Clemens and Cecil Fielder for a bunch of nobodies. And it was back in the day when we didn't have cell phones and internet. And (laughs) you would call the person and then the other person would call the commissioner, call you. And then the commissioner called the other team. And then you'd be, okay, you accept. And then, oh, you accept. Okay, trades through. So ever since that, I learned... I'm going to make up for this and I'm going to do the best I can from, from there on. I was hooked to get my revenge. Nice. Um, <laughs> this NF- NFBC platform is one of the best platforms I've ever played with. Since they fixed up the whole fab system, it's by far the best around. Honestly, I don't know how people can play in other leagues, especially if you play multiple leagues with anything else. What Derek was able to do this year and putting putting together the where you can copy your fab bids from one league to the other this year has been great. But let's not sell it short. Like the fab on NFBC has been heads and t- like heads and shoulders above just about every other platform before that happened. This was just an added bonus in my opinion. And so what Derek did, a round of applause for him on that. And he'll continue to be programming new and fun stuff, I'm sure in the future as well. So I think that was a great shout out. Yeah. So it, it saved me a lot of time, but then you have these other leagues that just take so much of your time and with a family and a kid and playing baseball with my nine-year-old. It's, are you going to come down and play with me, dad? Um, hold on. I'm making my bids. I'm almost so, done. I'm, I say that a lot. I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm almost done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my wife's probably going to divorce me any second now, but. <laughs> and now you're doing a podcast. Right. Right. Let's right. just add on right. to that. Oh, yes. I think something that Kevin and I know very well as we do this every week on top of our bids as well. Man, that's, I mean, I was, I always joke. I, it's. It's funny because it's not often I'm the youngest one on this podcast right now as I just just crossed the 40 year old mark a couple like two weeks ago. And so I have this very distinct memory, though, of my junior year, junior or senior year of high school. My ape, my biology teacher played fantasy baseball, but he would do it as old fashioned as possible. And this is back in 98. So he I think he had the opportunity of doing it online, but I think he was still doing it via the newspaper, via phone calls. He would post his teams and his stats up on the on a little cork board in the classroom so you could check it out if you really wanted to. Nobody knew what he was doing. And so I always thought that I was I felt pretty good about myself, the fact that I could say I started playing in 2001 over 20 years ago. And I've had the same league for 20 years and then obviously a bunch of other leagues on top of that throughout the last two decades to hear 91 that blows me out of the water. Kudos to keeping it up this long. Yeah, it was just for fun. A lot of these mm-hmm. leagues were fun. There was no money involved. 
But but the reason I got in touch with you guys on the wire group, Alex Vass is a great knowledge of pitching. And I have a friend here in St. Louis who's in our second league, Jeremy Gibbs, who him and I like meet up all the time, probably starting around January. And every week we meet up and do our rankings together. Nice. So he's really pushed me a lot. We do a lot of draft and holds together every year. And he's really helped me a lot in the winter times. And he's a great player too. I think he's in like third place in our league. So. <laughs> oh, great. So we have Jeremy and then we have you and Kevin who are in one, two in that league as well. So that's a nice tough league. And I'm glad I'm not in now. Thank you. <laughs> All right, cool, man. This is, I'm glad to have you. I'm glad to have fresh perspective and better late than never. I like to say the very last fab period (laughs) of the season. But you know what? I was telling this to Kevin, like in my mind, this week is all about making sure, every week is about this, but like more so than ever, it's about just making sure you're filling. It's like doing fab in a cut line or in the Raz, the Raz, the Raz slam. You just got to fill all the spots. So you need as many conditional bids as possible. You need to know all the players that you could possibly benefit you. And nobody has any money left, or at least nobody who's paying attention has money left. And so it's a matter of knowing as many players as possible. So we're going to hopefully get lots of recommendations throughout the episode. But let, let's. there's still some news that's happening. Players, players are still being put on the IL, which is... I know it's not new as in recent, but there was a time, especially when the rosters were expanding, where that just didn't happen. Like players were not being put on the IL in September because teams had a 40-man roster basically at their disposal. They didn't have to make room. But now teams are placing players on the IL to make room for call-ups for three days, four days. So we have a couple of those things to talk about. And then we will get into, Dennis, what you attribute to your success, especially in our in the On The Wire Listener League. So let's get into these news and notes. Kevin, I'm going to start with you here in Los Angeles. Dave Roberts, he announced that Tony Gonsolin, he should come off the IL and start Monday's matchup. He's only planning on letting Gonsolin go three innings. However, so assuming that plan sticks, uh, getting a win is not going to be a possibility, especially if he starts the game. He doesn't get an opener like Andrew Heaney did the other day. But knowing Gosling should get three, quote, guaranteed innings, uh, assuming he doesn't get blown up or anything, do you feel comfortable grabbing him and plugging him into your lineup for ratios and possible additional strikeouts? Oh, absolutely. We have 94 starting pitchers available for this coming week. That's if all the games are played. In a 15-team league, we're right at six per team. So there's going to be a lot of relievers being used anyway. Sure, the relievers get an an opportunity for a win once in a while, but not very many of them are probably going to get three innings if they're used at most two of the three days being played. So someone like Gonsolin, and we talked about Tyler Glass now last week, I would put him in the same category. I would love to have either one of these guys go in and knowing that I'm not going to get a win from either one of them. It it would be great. There's just such a limit, 94 plus. And that's every single starting pitcher going this week. There's a three-game series at Great American Small Park. I don't like any of these guys except Hunter (laughs) Green. Now we're under 90 already. Just one 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 series. We're already (laughs) under 90 starting pitchers. And there's many other examples like that. So the guys like Gonsolin and Glass now that we mentioned last week in a similar situation, I think could be very valuable this week. Yeah, it's a good call. We talk about... Looking at relievers throughout the season, one of the things that you want to look for in a reliever is you still want as many innings as possible, right? Obviously, you want guys that are going to go out and help your ratios, and maybe they vulture a win or maybe even vulture a save here or there, but you still want the innings. And so you really have to see who's been used throughout the weekend, who's lined up to pitch on Monday so that they can also pitch on Tuesday and or Wednesday. Gonsolin gives you the guaranteed three. Gonsolin has been, he's looked pretty good in in his rehab starts from everything I can tell. So as Nick Pollock would call it, I don't necessarily call this a still ill. If you need the win, obviously if the wins are the only category you care about going into this last couple days, sure. Gonsolin's not really an option for you, but 
if you need everything else, yeah, I'm on board. I'm, I agree with you. I'm on board with that. All right, Dennis, the Rockies, they put Charlie Blackman and Connor Joe on the IL. They ended their season a bit earlier than they probably would have liked, but instead the Rockies got back Jose Iglesias and Brendan Rogers in their infield. With the Rockies ending their season with three more games in LA, should we even care what moves they are making here? Colorado is last in just about every advanced stat imaginable in away games when not in cores. I'm not sure I trust any of them in those three last games versus Gonsolin, Urias, and Kershaw. But the Dodgers let those pitchers, will they let them go far in the games meet, when they not meaning anything? They're first in the division and they don't start their NLDS until October 11th. So maybe they play some mid relievers in there and maybe they get a Colorado gets a few few hits but uh, there's a couple of guys that I looked up and Ezekiel Tovar and Sean Bouchard is hitting pretty well if you need some power Diaz if you need some catching Alan Treo is another good option for middle infield his WRC plus is 135 over his last seven days so there's some good options for you if you want to start some Rockies in in LA Yeah, I don't want to do that, but I like to know what the options we have (laughs) at our disposal. So I appreciate the name call outs there. Actually, I think that's a great point that you made, though, about the Dodgers don't play a game for another week. Like most teams in the playoffs are going to be playing as soon as Thursday. And those teams that get those buys into the divisional series, they got another week ahead of them of no baseball. And so that's obviously a little bit different than in the past. So it would. I venture to guess that, yeah, those relievers are going to get some extra work because they're not going to want them to be that cold. Uh, they can do bullpens and they can do side sessions. I get that. Keep themselves fresh, but still put them in the game action. The thing is that the Dodgers bullpen's not a bad bullpen, minus Craig Kimbrell, maybe m- m- most of the time. And so I'm not, if they're getting their best stuff in short stints, I'm not sure that I trust most of the Colorado hitters to do much, any more with them than I would with the starters. Kevin, do you agree, disagree with that statement? No, I agree completely. That's exactly the way I think of it. It's going to be, it's really interesting. We may have a bit of a clearer picture with some of the other teams by the time Fab runs Sunday evening, but as far as the teams with the buys are concerned, they're set. Yeah, it looks like pretty clear that Houston, the Yankees, the Dodgers, and then whoever wins the NL East is going to be in, in that buy situation. So three out of those four are pretty much set. So you can take those to the bank and do with that information what you will when it comes to trying to pick up relievers to fill in your pitcher spots. All right, Kevin, this next note, they started off as a bow nailer tweet, if you will, as he was announced that he was going to be entering the fray on the Cleveland taxi squad. He did not get added to the Cleveland active roster until Saturday. He's not in the game on Saturday, so he will not be eligible to be picked up unless unless you have him in a DC or like at a draft and hold and you want to throw him in there. So instead, we'll move to New York where another top catching prospect, the top catching prospect, at least according to Major League Baseball's pipeline rankings go. Francisco Alvarez of the Mets gets called up. He did start on Friday, made his MLB debut, and he will be available to be bid on this weekend. So are you trusting the Mets to actually give him enough playing time going into this uh, in their final series after the Atlanta series to make him a viable option to throw on to make bids on? I don't think so. It's still up in the air as far as Atlanta and New York, as you mentioned, for winning the division and getting a bye or having to host a series in the wild card round. And so. It He played on Friday, that was versus a lefty, and now not in the lineup on Saturday versus a righty. It'll be interesting to see what happens on Sunday, but they're set to face three righties versus Washington on Monday through Wednesday. So I don't expect him to get the playing time here. It, I, he could, but I'm not counting on it. Yeah, I don't have any interest at all. I, I think there's just... At every roster spot, I 
so much can happen between Sunday night when our fab runs and Monday when we're plugging these guys in that I think that I'm going to want to be pretty sure my everybody's going to have more playing time secure than Francisco Alvarez where I, he, he, even if he's in there on Sunday, I don't think I could count on him for more than one game versus the three righties this coming week is probably what I would expect. Yeah, I would just, I'm going to go ahead and assume that they didn't call him up for no reason. I don't expect him to play in all three games for sure. I ex- I would expect him to start one of the three and then get in there either as a pinch hitter for at least one, if not both of the other two games, just to get his, he's a, top prospect in baseball according to at least one list they're going to bring him into the in, they're going to keep him on the roster in the playoffs from everything i can understand he is eligible so i would expect it i don't ex- i agree with you if he gets more than if i set the over under on seven plate appearances over the next three days are you taking the under i'm taking it uh, barely because I agree with your scenario. So I'm looking at five to six and it could be more, but if, but five or six would be where I would place it. So yes, I would go under seven. Yeah. And I think, and the thing is, this is a catcher scenario. So there'd be plenty of catchers that if you're desperate that you're picking up off the wire at this time of year, you might only get six plate appearances from any catcher <laughs> you pick up off the wire. So that is something to consider depending on who is available in your leagues. All right, Dennis, a couple of multi-positional players do make their return to their respective teams with Miami activating Joey Wendell off the IL and the Angels reinstating David Fletcher. If you were in need for lineup flexibility in the final week, per se, with you needing as many at-bats as possible, which of these guys gets a higher bid on your conditional bid and and why do you see it that way? I'd probably go... Wendell, he's got a little more position flexibility with corner infield and middle infield, whereas Fletcher is only middle infield. The other thing is I have both these guys in a couple different leagues this year. Fletcher was a guy that was a great contact hitter, and you can use him for pretty much just batting average only. Had a little bit of speed, but Wendell has a little bit of pop and and can run too. He has a better uh, uh, sprint speed than uh, Fletcher. And Don Mattingly has the fourth most attempts of stolen bases to second base of all the teams right now. I'd go with Wendell. When you use information like that with Mattingly sending as many players towards second base, to me, it's music to my ears. I love hearing stuff like that. And we are looking into stolen bases a lot more in the offseason. I'm sure everybody will be with all the rule changes. But that's a that's a major aspect to the game, especially that's a category that will make or break a lot of different uh, leagues going into the final three days. All right, Kevin, we'll stay in Miami then with both Avisel Garcia and Jesus Sanchez returning to the Marlins active roster as well as Wendell. Which one of them is likely to make an actual offensive impact in the final days, in your opinion? This is tough, and this is a decision I may have to make in more than one draft and hold league. These guys not on rosters at the moment in in many fab leagues, so they'll be available for us, but in, in draft and holds, and uh, there, there's more than one league where I have both of these guys rostered and I have not been able to make this decision yet. It's interesting. They're going to be playing Atlanta. Atlanta has a lot to play for still, as we have already mentioned multiple times in, in this podcast. And they got Bryce Elder and Jake Odorizzi both going from the right side on Monday and Tuesday, which would seem to probably favor... Sanchez. And I think that's probably the way I lean, but Abasil Garcia might be in the lineup all three days. Typically he has been in the lineup, although he was not on Saturday versus a lefty, but typically he's in the lineup most days. This could just be a rest day because he's only been back uh, for two games and he did play versus both a lefty on Thursday and a righty starter on Friday. So he may get in there for all three, but I think I'm leaning 
Sanchez versus the two right-handers on Monday and Tuesday. But it, this is a tough one. Yeah, I'm sure there's more than one other team listening that has that exact scenario as you're talking about having those two guys on their bench in a uh, in a draft and hold or two. And so, yeah, but luckily these guys are readily available <laughs> in many other fab leagues as well. So you can pick and choose, put them both on your conditional bids and pick the and put the one that you want higher and not be happy with getting the other one instead, but at least <laughs> knowing that they're pretty, they're, it's a difficult decision as Kevin, as you put it. And so if you end up with the other one, maybe you get lucky. What well, one other thing is if you're doing this, you're most likely looking for power and maximizing at bats, of course. And although he only has four this season, if you're hoping for a bonus stolen base, maybe to pop up in there, they'll Garcia probably gives you a better chance in, mm-hmm. in that respect. Sure. All right. We talked about, you mentioned Mattingly and obviously he'll be leaving Miami earlier. Dennis, you mentioned that talking about him and his stolen bases. So we know his departure may affect how the Marlins run in the future. We don't know, but another manager who will not be returning already is Tony La Russa. The White Sox announced that he will not return to manage the team this season or next season. With that in mind, Which players will this move impact most for you if you were to do a 2023 draft, say, today, later today? The history of Tony La Russa is probably the most important thing to answer this question is that if you look back at Tony La Russa's coaching habits back in 1987 with Oakland, he's the one that began the whole setup and closer and middle relievers once that starter went six innings, then they went to the middle guy and the effector or whatever you want to call it, then the setup man and then the closer. So he was that pro closer type of coach. So I think with him not there, Chicago might go to more of a, like a Tampa Bay style or more analytical approach for saves. So that might give more guys chances like Kendall Graveman or a bummer, Aaron Bummer. So that might be something to look into. Same thing with Mattingly. Larusa on the other end was on the bottom five coaches for stolen stolen bases attempts. With him being gone, maybe they run more. So those are my two takes on that situation. Yeah, I think the only thing holding that up in my mind is the amount of money that Liam Hendricks is making, and that that across the league, whenever somebody's being paid that kind of money unless they bring in another pitcher who makes just a little bit more money than that or roughly the same amount, they tend to at least try to squeeze out all the value from that, from each dollar that they can. So I would venture as long as Hendricks is there, he will obviously be the favorite for saves in Chicago. But that's not to say that he might be used three days in a row as he has done at least this season and in the past, and maybe Graveman gets in there a little bit earlier on those back-to-back scenarios as well. So I, I like I, I agree with the history lesson there. I do think that, I don't know, I would venture to guess that somebody making as much money as the contract that Hendricks have, that would at least keep his job safer. And maybe I'm saying that because I just drafted him in a dynasty league and I would like that to be the case in 2023. I would also like to draft Hendricks knowing, thinking that as well, but we all know saves are very fickle and it maybe not matter as much. <laughs> all right. The last thing here I want to mention, and Kevin, this is very specifically directed at you. Matt Carpenter, he might come back. He might have a chance at 30 home runs. He has to hit 15 more in three days. It's possible, right? As we were talking about earlier in the season, but he is not even guaranteed that he'll return to the Yankees, but Aaron Boone said that it is in play. He might also supposedly just spend some time at a secondary facility in Somerset where he could just take some live at bats and whatnot, be ready for the playoffs. But he may return to the Yankees lineups for this final series. They're also getting, the Yankees are also getting DJ LeMahieu back, or they got DJ LeMahieu back as well. So with the Yankees being one of the teams that have four games this coming week in the three days with a doubleheader on Tuesday. How are these moves 
and any others impacting your considerations for Yankees bats going into the uh, final week? Yeah, this is really interesting because they have four games that don't matter to them. We're going to see some of these. They don't matter to anybody except depending on what happens on Sunday, Aaron Judge, right? So Aaron Judge has played 40 consecutive games now, I think, maybe over 40 at this point. It's been a two or three days since his, I think was his when I saw it was his. Well, he's not getting a day off. Yeah, game. that's. <laughs> but if he happening. hits 62, he's probably getting the next day off, I would think. Mm. Now, I know the Yankees have five days off coming up, right? They'll have Thursday. Everybody's off Thursday, then the three game wild card series, and then everybody's off that following Monday before the division series start. I believe that's how it's working out. So they're going to have five days off after these four games they have this upcoming week. But this is going to be interesting that the games don't matter to the Yankees and they're facing. The Texas Rangers are going to throw three right-handed hitters out there. Matt Carpenter was hitting bombs in batting practice on Friday night, I I was seeing. I'm pretty excited about this because I think they want him to get in-game action because I fully expect they are going to use him uh, as they were earlier in the season if he's healthy and performing in the postseason he was one of their best hitters aside from Aaron Judge when he was in there earlier in the year yeah I'm definitely interested in here he probably even he probably doesn't play Monday we may not know till Tuesday because facing left-hander Martin Perez on Monday it's going to be tough to put him in a lineup because we'll hear more things but it might be right along the lines of everything you just said until he's added to the roster on Tuesday, if they are going to use him in one or two of the games of the doubleheader on Tuesday as a designated hitter, I would fully expect LeMayhew back. I, I, it's same. I expect them to get him in the lineup at, as much as they can over the next few days. Uh, I think they're going to want these guys to see game action prior to the postseason because even if they're not starting ball games, they are in the mix for at bats in the postseason, I would expect. Dennis, you've been following, if you've been following us at all this season, at the very least, our love for Matt Carpenter and what he's done when he when healthy. Do you have a take on his actual impact that he could make? And I, Kevin, I agree. You know what's going to happen. He's not going to start on Monday. And then we're going to be setting our lineups and we're not going to have a choice. Like the choice is going to be made for us. We're not going to put him in our lineups. He's going to play both games of the doubleheader, and then he's going to hit a couple bombs. That's yeah, just what's that, going to happen. That's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm calling it right now. <laughs> Dennis, do you see anything differently happening, or w- what's your take on the situation in New York? I'm a diehard Yankees fan, so I watch almost every single game. And I live in St. Louis, so I've watched Carpenter, too. It's pretty been pretty exciting, and all the St. Louis Cardinal fans here are happy for him, for sure. Kevin said it, think there's a chance if he was hitting bombs in practice, then I'm a podiatrist and he broke his foot. So I always think it's about eight weeks. And so I can't remember exactly what day he broke it. I think it's maybe been six or seven weeks ago. So I don't know. He's over 30. I don't know how quickly he'll heal. He might have some soreness in there, but, and then where is he going to play? Is Cabrera going to be benched now? And he's been hot. Is he going to just play first base for Rizzo a couple games or DH for Stanton or where is he going to play? I can imagine ex- exactly what you said. If he's if he's coming back a little earlier than you might expect, then DH is the obvious spot for him. At least he stays off his feet for the majority of the game, except when he's actually in the box or tr- hopefully trotting around the bases at a very slow, manageable pace. But yeah, for really first and DH are really the only spots that make any possible sense, at least in this short series. Maybe they expand that later in the playoffs as he heals up a little bit more. But that's where I would expect him. To Didn't be he play hit. right field? Wasn't he playing right field at one point in time? I thought he played right field one time before he got yeah. hurt. But the state the Yankees outfield was in at one point in the season, it would not have surprised me whatsoever. Yeah. If they put Matt Carpenter in right field. All right, guys, that is going to do it. That's going to wrap it up our news and notes section for this episode. As always, we miss a bunch of stuff. 
worth noting and uh, keep up with all that extra stuff you should be making you should be listening to the first pitch podcast with chad young scott chu and daniel port they'll be going through the regular season with their final episode scheduled to come out on thursday the day after game 162 so make sure you're listening to them throughout the week to learn about all the highlights analysis and everything you need to know to win your fantasy league up to the last possible day just a moment, we're going to talk to Dennis about his overall experience in the inaugural on the Wire Listener League. Before we do that, we are going to take this quick break. Hey, Alex Fast here, and thanks for listening to this podcast on the Pitcher List Podcast Network. If you're a fan, consider supporting all of us by getting a PL Plus subscription, where you're going to get an ad-free website and get access to our Discord, where you can talk to all of our podcast hosts and staff. Plus, you can hang out with our incredible Pitcher List community. It's basically a baseball sanctuary year-round for as low as $8 a month. You can sign up at PitcherList.com backslash plus, and you're going to get your first month free with promo code podcast also don't forget to check out everything else we do as well from youtube videos live streams newsletters off-season articles tiktoks breakdowns over 15 baseball podcasts on our network we can't stop talking about baseball even during the off-season so sign up for pl plus today at pitcherlist.com backslash plus and use promo code podcast to get your first month free all right thanks for listening let's get back to the show We are back, and of course, you are listening to On The Wire. I am Adam Howe, joined by co-host Kevin Hastings. And this week, we are joined by special guest Dennis Timko, who currently sits at top of the On The Wire Listener League overall standings. There are five 12-team leagues this year, all hosted on the NFC platform. We completed the five drafts between December and March, and of course, they're all fab leagues. As that is our focus every each and every week with the same amount. It's basically the same setup as the NFBC online championships as 12 team or fab leagues as well. We'll be doing the league once again for the 2023 season. I'm excited for that. The first draft kicking off as early as November when the NFC NFBC platform switches over to the 2023 season after the playoffs conclude. So keep an eye out for more info on that through our Twitter account and various other. uh, We'll be talking about it on the show as well. For now, Dennis, I want to talk to you, man, about your success this season. You, As I mentioned a couple of times, you currently sit at the top of the leaderboard here in the Listener League. Above the likes of former guests of the show, Steve Giswelli, Lucas Beery, Greg Jewett, Todd Zola, George Montanez, both Kevin and myself. And as I mentioned, Yancey Eaton earlier in the show, that rounds out most of the names in the current top 10 or top 12 of the overall standing. Special shout out to those guys for being in the mix as well. But I want to talk to you, man. You're ahead of everybody and you have been for quite some time jumping around first, second, third for a while, but really holding on to the first rank for at least I think the last couple of weeks of the season. You got a decent little lead, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's I think it's 10 points or thereabouts. I just switched leagues, so I don't have the standings in front of me anymore. I probably should. And But tell me about your success here, man. Do you credit more? Is a typical question I ask when somebody's having a very successful season this late in the season. Is it more draft? And you've just been lucky with your draft picks and the value you've got there? Or have you made some really savvy fab moves throughout the course of the season? Right after the draft, my friend Jeremy and I always go over our drafts. And they have that draft grade on NFBC, has <laughs> yes. that grade. That grade was like a D plus. Oh, I me. love those grades. <laughs> and I was like, I thought I had a good team. I thought I drafted a good team. So I really felt that my draft was what carried me. I rarely take a starting pitcher early. And most of my drafts, I do 15 team leagues. So I'm really deep in knowledge of more players. So I felt like the 12 team leagues, I knew a lot more of the player pool. So I went ahead and took a starting pitcher early with Burns. He fell to me at the last pick at 12. And in a fab league, I figured it made sense to take an ace early because if it didn't work out, you could always find somebody else. To back up that, I went Devers and then got Class A in the fourth. So I got 40 saves right there. And then I felt I did okay the next few picks later. A couple of duds with Castellanos and Eloy. But my biggest steal was J-Rod in the 20th round. 
and then Swanson in the 10th round was a solid pick. I double tapped on short stops in the 9th and 10th rounds with Adamnes and Swanson, and then Hoskins in the 11th round was another solid pick. So you could see pretty much my draft was pretty solid. My, my fab pickups were Merrill Kelly mid-April. That kind of helped me with my loss of Severino and Scooble. I remember when we were doing the draft, I think it was Scott Chu was a big Scooble fan. And that, I remember him commenting, familiar. Yeah. <laughs> I remember him commenting, who who took Scooble? And I was like, oh, I did. Sorry. <laughs> <On those notes. laughs> but I guess it really didn't matter. <laughs> But pretty much Merrill Kelly and Christian Walker was another good pickup that I made sometime in May. And he wasn't even my first choice. I think he was my third conditional pick. So it fell to me. So that's like that luck factor came in there. Josh Naylor was another one. I think he had a game where he had eight RBIs and two home runs in May. I think my draft is what did it. I never really did focus on the overall. It wasn't until... I think Todd Zola was talking on one of his podcasts about being in the top five in some league. And then I was like, wait a minute, I think that's our league. And it was, he was, I think, right behind me. And I looked at it and went, oh my God, Todd Zola's creeping up on me. I didn't even realize I was in first. So I think with the luck, I didn't have any major injuries until Severino, Polanco and Castellanos, and then J-Rod toward the end of the year. I think pretty much my draft was my success. Yeah, it's the, I guess, beauty is not the right word, but like we were talking about head-to-head leagues earlier in the episode and losing J-Rod when you did in a head-to-head is, it can be league losing. At least in this, in a roto format, you got to bank everything he did and it actually matters and it actually helped you along the way. So to lose him for the last week and a half, two weeks of the season doesn't hurt as as hard as a head-to-head league championship run would have. So you have that going for you, which is nice. Kevin, you sit in fourth overall as I finally refreshed the standings here. And this is the same team I'm pretty sure is, yeah, right behind Dennis in this one. Have you ever felt, I felt like we talked about this league earlier in the season. At any point though, did you ever feel as though you had a chance of taking this league? Or has, have you felt Dennis has had this under control? Three or four weeks ago, we were still going back and forth a little bit, but he took over roughly three weeks ago, maybe four, like I said, and it's, he's been opening a lead ever since. He's What's interesting, his pitching. He's got a great pitching staff. He lead, He's ahead of me in every pitching category, and I there's not much I can do about it at this point. Yeah, this is pretty much wrapped up as far as the league goes. Ten and a half point lead in the overall with Lucas Beery trying to catch him. Three to four days to go. He's probably pretty safe, but he's definitely safe in our league. League. So he can take a look. He can pay more attention to overall category standings, setting his lineup on Monday and not have to pay attention to where he sits in our league standings, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that two months ago, three months ago, about when you start looking at the overall standings. And Des, I'm glad you mentioned that. But as you get closer and closer to the end of the season, it makes it much a much easier choice of what direction you are going to be, <laughs> where you're going to be focusing all of your attention onto. And if you're in a situation like you are, Dennis, like you obviously can pick and choose what's going to help you the most to hold on to that overall lead, as opposed to worrying about Kevin jumping up in the, in the league standings. With it's this funny. Kind of- I was looking at his draft board a couple of nights ago and I forgot that we had done this draft early. And I was flabbergasted. Julio Rodriguez in the 20th round. How did we let that happen? And I, oh, yeah, we did. This was early. We didn't know he was starting the season with the team. We didn't know anything about that. Yeah. This is the beauty of doing those early drafts, though, right? That's why people will hear it all. We'll hear it all through October and November. What's the benefits of doing early drafts? There's a lot of (laughs) negative. 20th round Julio Rodriguez. That's That's going to be my answer all year long. That doesn't happen in March. Ask ask Dennis Timko. Just (laughs) ask him. (laughs) That's why you got to do your rankings like right now. Get ready for next year. (laughs) Never too early rankings. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, this sound of success, Dennis, at least in our league, we won't get into your other draft and holds in other leagues that you're doing, but uh, what do you think you have are taking away from the success you've had in this league going into 2023? How is it going to, what adjustments do you think you're going to have to make to continue hoping and assuming you're going to jump in these leagues at least once next season? Are you going to have to make some kind of adjustment to hold on to that success moving forward? Probably stick with NFPC leagues only for my fabs. <laughs> but I think with my fabs, my early picks, I think I spent too much on guys that I got too overly excited about that I probably shouldn't have. And spent like 30% of my fab on three guys that didn't really do much for me. So that's something I got to really work on. But overall, I think I'm pretty solid at my draft knowledge and my strategy. So I should be okay. So if you had to guess, if we, like I mentioned earlier in the show, we're going to be bringing these back next year. And we're, our plan is we're going to do one draft a month from November through March, possibly two in March. In your opinion, would you prefer to do a November, ver- like if you only could do one of the five or six leagues that we do, are you going to prefer to do a draft in November or one in March? Probably in the middle. Like I like that January because... I get my learning and I start studying right around Christmas time. We have a group of guys that do a Santa league and that's like our first league of the year of the season. So that's like where I start to study and really get deep into the drafting. So probably like mid January would be best because you do it too early, like November, you get injuries. You don't know what happens with, the lineups and coaches and where the players are going by the time spring training comes. That's fair. I like how you split the difference on that question though. That was uh, that was profesh- very professional of you. <laughs> All right, guys, we have a lot of, we got a lot to talk about. We got a lot of players to recommend here, at least ones that everybody should be keeping an eye out, whether or not they're available in their leagues to consider for their conditional bids going into the final fab period. Got to spend it. You can't take it with you. Might as well, right? So let's get right into it. Kevin, let's go right into our power category. Who are you looking at if you are desperate for some power in the final three days of the season? I'm looking at Juan Yepes in St. Louis. He's got more availability than I realized. I know he hasn't been back with the team long. It's interesting. His roster ship is almost identical in the 15-team main event and the 12 team online championships at just over a third in both. So available in almost two thirds of leagues out there. And they do the Cardinals do face at least one lefty this week. So he'll most definitely be in the lineup that day, I believe. And probably more than that, St. Louis, another one of those teams. Now they only will have one day off. They will be hosting a wild card round, but that's set. They can't move up or down, I don't believe. So I could see them giving some other guys' days off. And that's what's really interesting about Yepes here over the past week. He's been in there all over the field. He's played left field a game. He's played third base a game. He's played DH a game all in his three last three starts. So he can give all these starters a breather as they're getting ready to begin their postseason on Friday. Yeah, to agree with that, St. Louis is stuck in the three seed, if you will, and they will be they will be hosting the first round, the wild card round in St. Louis. They only have the one off day there. All right, Dennis, if it, whether it's this league or any other fab league you're in, who do you think you're looking at to add some power if you might need it? Nick is up, and I'm not sure how much he'll play with uh, J-Rod coming back, possibly for a game or two, and he's hit a couple of home runs in the last few days. Another guy, Sam Huff, is a catcher that has hit a couple of home runs for Texas, who's a big dude. He might get you some power if you need something for catcher. And then Patrick Wisdom, I don't know how much he's owned in other leagues. He's going against some three right-handed pitchers, so... That might be something to look at there. But I like the Yepes pick from Kevin. 
I've had Sam Huff in too many of my draft and hold leagues starting for the last two months, <laughs> just due to my catcher situation. So I like what he's been doing, sure, but I wish he didn't have to be in my active starting catching spot for as long as he had been. That might be all right for these last few days. This is, a, we talked real early in the season about sometimes you don't realize how bad a certain player has been recently if you're just setting it and forgetting it and that can happen with the catcher position and as good as he was in the first half Jonah Heim has not been good recently something to consider going into 2023 for sure one of those one of those guys you want to look at those splits and actually see if it actually means anything let's get into our speed category here guys Kevin who might turn the tables in stolen bases and or runs if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, Dennis has this guy down too, but he's got multiple guys. So I'm sticking with him and it's Dylan Moore in Seattle. We talked about him earlier in the season as well, but it's been a while and he is still stealing bases. He still can't hit, but he can get on base. I don't know if there's a larger gap between batting average and on base percentage in all of baseball with as many plate appearances as Dylan Moore has. He's got like a 367 on base percentage and hitting 213. I think those numbers might not be exact. I don't have his page in front of me, but I had looked at it earlier, but he's got over 20 stolen bases on the season, multiple this week. Again, Seattle, in my opinion, has quite a bit to play for still on Saturday. Not surprising. Half of their regular hitters on the bench. I'm sure they're hung over <laughs> still as we're <laughs> recording so. on Saturday after, <laughs> after Friday evening, Cal Raleigh heroics, which was awesome to watch for anybody other than probably Baltimore Orioles fans. I think that was the team they officially eliminated, but yeah, it, it was just great to see and fun to watch, but that kind of brings up my point there's still a shot that they can host a wild the wild card round and that would be huge for this team and i think they know that and they're one of the teams that has four games this week i see them trying to go out and put their best lineup out there for four days and recently that has been with dylan moore in the lineup like i said his batting average is abysmal that shouldn't hurt us too much in roto leagues, which I think is pretty much all that's left. Some head-to-head leagues might have had a 10-day period for their championship round, but I haven't seen too many of those around. I think we're talking mostly roto here. So he's not going to do too much damage to your batting average in four games. And I would be surprised if he does not steal a base this week. Yeah, the only only name after a really quick glance that I could find that had a swing between OBP and batting average was Anthony Rizzo. He's the only one that I could find that had an over over 100 point swing between the two with a 226 average and a 339 OBP. And as you mentioned, Dylan Moore's swing is is quite something as well with his 219 average and his 361. So he still got Rizzo by quite a large margin. Ah. <laughs> but the only honorable mention I could really find quickly was Rizzo. Dennis, anybody out there as well that you might be eyeing for some speed if that's the category you're looking for? With Texas having four games against the Yankees, that Bubba Thompson guy might be uh, get you a couple steals. He's had two steals this last week, C.J. Abrams also is playing every day, I think, now in Washington. And Oswaldo Cabrera for the Yankees, I've been watching. That kid looks good. Switch hitter and been playing pretty well for the Yankees and filling in. So you got a lot of speed there. And Kevin talked about Dylan Moore with his four games. So I, another guy is Whit Merrifield. He's now playing every day for Toronto. He was dropped in my Slarf League, so... I don't know if he's available in anybody's leagues too. Yeah, I guarantee you. I don't have this in front of me, but I guarantee you Merrifield's still readily available in (laughs) in a lot of teams that have dropped, especially 12-teamers. Yeah, it's interesting to see. Like the Bubba Thompson call out, I know he's rostered in a whole bunch of places, but just the fact that he's on a team that obviously isn't playing for a playoff spot, playing up against a team that's already clinched their playoff berth and probably their spot. I think the, the Yankees will have clinched their bye today as we're recording this on Saturday 
and to see how the Yankees, how they act toward base runners throughout the course of a series that literally doesn't mean anything to anybody. If any of those games get rained out, then they won't get they won't get made up in all logical sense. So it's a good call out there and just something to consider when you are looking at your uh, your options. All right, let's look at some opportunities ahead of us, guys. Not a lot of schedule notes as there are only three days left. Everybody's playing all three days. We have two doubleheaders scheduled for Tuesday. That is, of course, as we mentioned already, Texas and New York are playing a doubleheader on Tuesday, as well as Detroit and Seattle. They also have their doubleheader on Tuesday. And assuming there are no rainouts on Sunday or games that have to be postponed for any reason that would get postponed to Thursday, the season will end on Wednesday. So there is no game 163. All the tiebreakers are in place. They won't have to use that extra game. The only reason there would be any games on Thursday is if a meaningful game gets rained out on Tuesday, say maybe an Atlanta New York Mets game, which obviously is one of the very few races that we are seeing as being really close. Obviously, Milwaukee and Philadelphia are vying for a playoff spot with the wild cards. But if, say, the Pirates get rained out, they're not playing anybody <laughs> on Sunday that it matters. They won't make up that game. So you'll actually just lose out on at-bats and innings in that scenario. So I apologize in advance to anybody who finds themselves in that situation. So with all these, with all the limited amount of games that are left, Kevin, there are a couple, like I said, there are four teams with at guaranteed four games pending any rainouts. Who looks like they might be able to take advantage of the situation at hand? This is tough for me because this is every category we're talking about right now all season long really we've been making that statement for a couple weeks on a lot of things we talk about we should worry about this all year but it really matters more right now so it and it does so we're taking this into account when we're looking at every single category we're looking at the opportunity but a guy that doesn't really fit in a category because he's not great at anything Harold Castro in Detroit one of the teams that does have four games this week wouldn't be surprised if he's in the lineup for all four of them for the past six games and seven of the last eight he's been in either the three or four spot in the lineup as we talked last week and it happened a couple more times this week Detroit is going out and putting large large sums of runs together against some of these teams they've been playing over the past couple of weeks. And so being in the three or four spot in a lineup that scoring runs is very beneficial. Shouldn't it would be difficult to hurt your batting average in four games too much. But if that's where you're really tight, that's where he has excelled this season with a 275 batting average on the season and 430 plate appearances. He does have seven home runs, so you could hope that he adds to that this week. Like I said, not his strength. He's not great. He's not going to steal a base. If you're looking for stolen bases, this is not your guy. But for batting average, runs, RBI in the middle of a lineup that has been producing better recently than they had earlier in the season and that fourth game i like harold castro this week yeah it's all about volume right in this scenario who's gonna who's gonna like you said actually i like that call out the fact that it's really difficult to hurt your batting end so unless you are in one of those scenarios where you're like 0.001 or 0.0001 away from your nearest competitor maybe don't worry about losing a spot in batting average per se but he can at least tread water and help you in the category if nothing else is there anybody else dennis that you might be having your eye on for a pure volume play based on the amount of games that are being played in the last couple days i think you hit it all i think the under the radar option would be cubs players going against a weaker cincinnati pitching staff except for hunter green yeah, plus the, since he's actually back in Cincinnati for their final series, so that's nice to see those bats possibly coming alive on both sides of the ball. But especially the Cubs taking advantage of finishing their uh, finishing their se- their season in Great America Small Park. So it's a good call out there. I didn't mention that. Thank you. Let's get into our pitching, guys. Wins and K is going to be hard to come by in only three days, right? So. 
who might you be looking at? Dennis, I'm going to start here with you in the pitching categories. Who could walk themselves into? I think the toughest part here for me is at any given time, a pitcher, especially a starting pitcher, could get scratched at the last second, especially in one of the playoff teams as they're trying to maneuver their their playoffs rotations and what have you. But assuming all things fall into place the way that we see them right now, who do you have your eye on? Right now, Bryce Elder is scheduled to pitch on Monday, and he had an, what a complete game his last time. I'm not sure if they'll pitch him if Atlanta's still trying to fight for that first place. Who else do they have going? Rich Hill is another guy against Tampa Bay who, if I recall, Tampa Bay strikes out a lot. And Rich Hill has been piling up strikeouts lately. A guy named Davis Martin for the White Sox against Minnesota. And I don't think he's going against anybody strong. And he won his last game at San Diego. Um, Dean Kramer is another guy that me and my friend Jeremy always drafted in our draft and holds for the last few years and never panned out, but I think he's starting to look pretty good this year. He's going against Toronto, who has nothing to play for. And then Assad from the Cubs. And you talked about Glass now previously, I believe, and he might be pitching a few innings this week and might get a few Ks and low get some low ratios for you. I'm finishing the season traveling to Boston myself, being from the area a little bit of a birthday present for myself going to Fenway on Tuesday. I was really hoping that would turn out to be a glass now return start. It doesn't look like it looks like I'm going to get Jeremy Springs, but uh, who's to say that doesn't, they don't switch that around and it would be a very pleasant surprise to be in the presence of what glass now has been doing. So I'll be watching that regardless of whether he's on any of my fantasy teams or not. Kevin, any other names out there that might be available that Dennis didn't, didn't throw out there? Yeah, I like what a guy that's been talked about quite a bit over the past couple of weeks because of his two matchups to end the season versus Oakland. That's Michael Lorenzen. He did just what we thought he would do in the first matchup, and he gets him again at Oakland this week. Only 32% rostered in 12-team online championships, 85% in the main event, so even available on some of those teams. I expect him to be picked up in all of those 15-team leagues. Aaron Savale gets the Kansas City Royals, who, as much as I hate to admit it, have been horrid versus right-handed pitching. Even with some of the exciting young bats they have, they're in the bottom five in the league on the season in OPS versus right-handers. He is almost universally rostered in 15-teamers, but rostered in less than half of the 12-team in FBC leagues. And then Nathan Eovaldi, it was surprising to me, Went five and two thirds in, in his first game back, and he is across the board rostered in just over half of leagues 55%, 55%, 58% when we're talking main event, online championship, and Yahoo leagues. So he's available in almost half of all leagues out there. And if, yeah, five and two thirds in his first game back, typically I probably would have thought I would have to move him down like I did with Glasnow now last week and consider him more for ratios than wins and Ks. But if they're going to give him the innings one more time this season so they can keep him going to see what they have for next season, that would be great with Eovaldi as well. Yeah, you got to assume he's got a little bit of a something to prove attitude going in into his final start of the season, going into the offseason as well. Of course, going against his former team as well. I don't think there's any bad blood there, but regardless, it's a situation where he's playing on a team that has nothing to play for but he's in a situation personally that he's going to want to get as much out of it as possible i think so yeah i can see as long as he's somewhat efficient going that five to six innings would should be a um, almost a given as long as as long as cora lets him do it all right let's get some ratio guys some names out there for everybody Dennis, is there anybody else out there that could be, if you're not worried about wins, if you're not worried about strikeouts, if you're only looking at salvaging whatever is left of your ERA and whip that you might be considering to fill in your roster spots? I really didn't have anything on this one. I have an ESPN league that I use that's an AL only and then a mixed. And the mixed, you have a max amount of starters. And so my starters 
I have one left. Yep. <laughs> so now I'm like <laughs> dropping guys like Webb and Musgrove and stuff, trying to find these ratio guys just to get me a couple innings here and there. But I couldn't think of anybody for a deeper league like ours. But I see Kevin has some that he can go over here. Yeah, we didn't mention it, but Logan Webb, you can go ahead and drop him everywhere because he's not starting again for the rest of the season. I should have probably threw that in the news and notes section. I'm glad you brought his name up just so I could throw it out there in case anybody wasn't aware. Go ahead and feel free to fill his roster spot in every league as he has been put on the IL and will not make another start for San Francisco. Kevin, all right, let's get into what uh, who's going to be filling out your conditional bids in this area where needed. Yeah, the Seattle guys. As I mentioned, I think they are going to go out and play for uh, hosting a wild card matchup. And they got the four games, and their bullpen has been amazing all season long. So Munoz has been great. He is probably the most rostered of these guys because he does get a few more save chances than the rest of them. Diego Castillo, Matt Brash, and, and Eric Swanson, who we talked about earlier in the season. His ratios have been stellar this year. And any of these guys could accidentally run into a win. These are the guys, if you're chasing wins, right? I'm I like I said, there, there's only roughly 90 starting pitchers going this week. Probably at least a third of them, even if I am desperate for wins. I'd probably rather throw a guy like this out there. We talk about it all season long. I, I You probably have a better chance at one of these guys snagging a win in, in four games. It takes luck. As Todd Zola said, good team, guy that gets opportunities once in a while. Let's throw these guys out there because, yeah, there's a lot of bad matchups this week and not a lot of good ones with starting pitching that is available. So even though, like I talked with batting average, we're probably not doing a whole lot with our ratios in four games. You can a little bit. And as you like to point out a lot, your opponents can come back to you a little bit as well. But we're probably in most cases looking for counting stats or looking for just somebody to help stabilize. If we are throwing someone out there that has a uh, blow up concerns, hoping for a win and some strikeouts, a couple of guys like this can help stabilize that. But yeah, in the, any of the Seattle guys can help in that situation. And just like the guys we've talked about in this category all season long, unless they ended up getting a closer role at some point, they're still widely available. We, Every everybody who recommends a streaming starting pitcher for the last three four months always picks the guy who's going up against Detroit. So why not <laughs> pick up every reliever that's going up against Detroit in only three games? Sorry, in only three days. On top of that, they have the added fourth game with a doubleheader on Tuesday. So they're gonna get. They're almost all of them are gonna get some work, if not three innings worth of work as we talked about the top of the show three innings if you're getting three innings out of your reliever for the next three days then that's what you should be shooting for i don't know if i can add here i just pulled up my espn fab here for tomorrow morning since this won't be published till after it goes through i i put down cody morris who's no longer starting ryan tapera hunter brown trevor steven colin pache zach efflin Colin McHugh, Chris Martin, Nick Martinez. So these guys might get you some, there's plenty of options there. Yeah, that's the key, man. You got to put, you got to get as many options on that conditional bid list as you can, because you want to be able to at least fill in those innings pitched in the last couple of days. I like how you have a former MVP vote getter in that list. And I'll let everybody guess who that might've been. Um, and, (laughs) And you can put off your decision a little bit as well. But there's a lot of guys we can drop. A lot of our starting pitchers we know aren't going anymore. We can add Alec Manoa to that list now. We can add Sandy Alcantara to that list we found out on Saturday. We'll probably find out more by Sunday night. Drop them all. Pick as many of these guys up as you can, and we can put our decisions off until game time on Monday 
We don't have to make it on Sunday. The more information we can get before we set our lineups in these tight leagues, the better. Great comment there, Kevin. That's a good point. Just fill that roster with active players. Simple as that. All right, last actual category here with looking for some saves as we have been all season long. Dennis, who might you be looking at to vulture at least one save over the last three days? Just found out that Clay Holmes is out for the rest of the season. So who's closing in New York with four games to go? I think Scott Efros is the guy that they probably are going to go to. He's been the most effective reliever right now for them. Yeah, Efros would definitely be the one I would go going toward. Luis Siga would obviously be an option as well, who's not going to hurt you in those categories. I can't bring myself to bring Chapman back onto a roster at this point. (laughs) I don't know how you guys feel about that one, but I'm very curious to see what happens with Chapman in the off season. And if he lands in a, as a free agent, he actually lands somewhere one and two actually lands in a spot like a Miami type of place or somebody that, or a place where he actually could compete and take over a spot if he does something in the off season. So that'd be, I'm sure it'll be something that everybody's watching. It'll be a situation that if you do an early draft, you can get a guy like Chapman in a late round and maybe it all turns out great. (laughs) And maybe it, you, he never plays a day on your active roster. Who's to say? All right, so definitely a situation to monitor come bid time for sure. And again, Yankees also have four day, four games, plenty of opportunities for all of their bullpen pieces to get plenty of innings in there. So not really a wrong answer if you're focusing on that situation. Kevin, anybody else out there that might swipe a save for any reason or another? Yeah, if this is, the, and just like we were talking before about throwing middle relievers out there, if you're chasing saves, it's there's some guys that have gotten opportunities recently that may not be the guy. In fact, they probably aren't the guy, but there's still a chance of them, a better chance than others may have of getting in there. And Manuel Rodriguez for the Cubs had save opportunities. What's interesting was it was on back-to-back nights this week so he got two of the four saves that he has on the season since just being called up at the end of august four saves two of them this week three saves in his last five appearances yes it was brandon hughes who got the most recent save opportunity and that's probably who we expect would be the guy if we had to name one. But the fact that Rodriguez has got two recently, and the thing for me on back-to-back nights, so Hughes was probably ready to go, and they gave Rodriguez another opportunity. It's just somebody, if you're, that this is one where you may need four, five, six saves to really make up some ground, and it's not impossible if you're dumping all your starters and throwing nine guys like this out there or seven guys like this, hopefully you have a couple of closers on your roster. Yeah, that's a good point. We talk about that with the offensive categories. If you're only focusing on stolen bases, you're, you're benching or dropping all your power guys who aren't going to help you in that category and vice versa. It's true, especially in the final week of the season with as little amount of starting pitches. as Kevin mentioned, there's only 94 of them through the rest of the season, dropping them all and filling them all with relievers who have a chance at vulturing a save. And you can get, and even in three days, you can get five or six saves. As you mentioned, if all of all the planets align and everything works out exactly the way you're hoping. This is one of those things that won't work for me, but it would work against me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, guys, favorite category here. Kevin, I'm going to start with you on this one. Wild card, obviously, whatever you want to say, who you want to talk about. And I know we talked about him in the news and notes, but I put him in. He was, I think, the first player I put on the rundown for this week (laughs) because it is. He is, with four days to go, a wild card, and that's Matt Carpenter. And it will be a gamble. I don't think we'll know before we have to set our lineups on Monday and the Yankees play on Monday. It's not a not where we would have the opportunity to make a change on Tuesday. But if I really need power in spots and there are spots I do, especially a couple of 15 team leagues where there's 
I'm surprised. There was a couple of weeks recently where we talked about after it seeming like the power department was a little drier than usual as far as waiver wire ads go. Then we had a couple of weeks where it seemed like there was a lot of options where we're back. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot of options this week. And it, if it's what you need and nothing else will work, it, it's, it can be a risk worth taking with a guy like Matt Carpenter. But it's definitely a wild card because we don't even know if he's going to play. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In the same vein, Dennis, uh, who's your wild card for the final week? Every year in the beginning of the year when I do my rankings, I do a rookie is a rookie list and I go over some possible prospects that could be coming up. And I take that a rookie from uh, Lenny Melnick, who I listen to every day in the morning. Great guy. And he's come and visit us a couple of years ago. But uh, the guy I had on that list was Gabriel Arias from Cleveland. So if you need a middle infielder, he just hit his first home run this week and might get some at-bats. I think he's in the lineup last couple of days. So that's my wild card. <laughs> Those rookies that cut called up in the final week of the season, final, the final seven days of the season, are as wild cards get. So I like the call out there for sure. At least he's available as opposed to his now teammate, Bo Naylor, who has not made his debut as time as we've recorded this, which is unfortunate. So I'm sure there would be some bids for his services going into the final couple of days, even at the catcher position. All right. Guys, those are the last players that we are going to recommend or at least throw out into the ether for everybody to consider in for the 2022 season. Kevin, it's been a blast. What are your final parting words for everybody to consider as they go into their final bid? Yeah, changing the subject just a little bit, but it's still fab in a lot of dynasty leagues and you can improve your team going forward in the final fab run of the current season in a lot of leagues depending on your rules a couple of minor head-to-head leagues we can't make pickups anymore but in the leagues where there's still fab this week if you have guys that you don't foresee being on your team next season why not throw a dart at somebody that we don't know what's going to happen through the off season. We don't know where they're going to end up. Sure. uh, All the top prospects are gone. We know that, but in more than one league, this is how I got Vinny Pasquantino last season. He was still was not a big name, even at the end of last season after what he would had done because he was doing it for the Kansas city Royals and he hadn't done it before in their minor league organization. And most of it had been at double a. So I remember, I think Eric cross for sure had been talking about him a little bit and I'm sure some others, but I got him in the last week or two of the season. So it can happen. Armchair Roto on Twitter, Russell, who is the commissioner of the TARF league tweeted something out to this effect a few days ago. And I cannot agree with it more. You can make your dynasty teams better in, in this final fab run, taking a dart at a couple of guys that you definitely aren't using this season. Yeah, yeah, I definitely did that in in my home dynasty league when I got kicked out of the playoffs. The f- the following week, picked up four guys, just dropped Adam Wainwright and other guys I knew. I'm like, well, I'm not keeping them. I'll take darts on on um, Dre Jameson in Arizona, Luis yeah. Ortiz in in Pittsburgh, and what have you. And so would like to echo your sentiment tenfold on that one. So always the off season doesn't ever start, right? You're always playing your own, you're t- taking advantage of whatever rules that you can figure out and, and running with it, especially in those type of, in those type of leagues. All right. That is going to do it. I want to take some extra time to thank Dennis Timko for joining us again this week. Dennis, thank you, man. Good luck in the final run of the season. Do you have any other final thoughts for everybody as uh, as you make the run for the inaugural on on the wire overall championship or any other words of wisdom that you'd like to impart? I just want to say thanks for inviting me to the league and it's been exciting last month here. It's like my blood pressure I think went up 10 <laughs> points because I keep looking at this overall thing now almost constantly at work between patients. I'm like, where am I? Oh, I... One of my guys, Hoskins, just hit a home run. Did I go up at all? So it's been crazy. (laughs) So much fun. Uh, 
It is so much fun. And we hope you for the least stress necessary going into the final couple of days. All right, guys, that is going to wrap it up for episode 79 of On The Wire. Please make sure to subscribe, share, and review the podcast wherever you are listening. Keep a lookout for Kevin's final companion article over at PitcherList.com. It comes out on Sunday afternoon as well. We will be back in, throughout the off season with new guests and as we prep, as we start prepping for drafting in 2023 as soon as 2022 ends. So keep a lookout for all those episodes coming forth and keep that subscription active to the pod. You can follow myself on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. Kevin is at Hasting Kevin. Of course, follow the pod itself at On The Wire Pod. I'd like to once again, thank our guest, Dennis Kim- Timko, for joining us. Follow him on the Twitter at STL Feet Doc. And with that, I am Adam Howe. On behalf of Kevin Hastings, thanks for listening. And with that, we bid you goodbye. I'm Roman Mars, host of 99% Invisible. I'm excited to be teaming up with Lexus GX and Sirius XM on some very special 99PI episodes. We're heading to some of the cities in the U.S. that have special meaning for me and exploring the ways that these cities marry form and function. To learn more about the Lexus GX and Sirius XM and Lexus vehicles, visit Lexus.com slash GX and SiriusXM.com slash Lexus Trial. The all-new Lexus GX. Live up to it. Check out the 99% Invisible feed now and listen to these special episodes. At Amica Insurance, we know it's more than a life policy. It's about the promise and the responsibility that comes with being a new parent, being there day and night, and building a plan for tomorrow, today. For the ones you'll always look out for, trust Amica Life Insurance. Amica. Empathy is our best policy. Introducing the second best buffalo thing, Cheetos Crunchy Buffalo. Nothing beats buffalo wings on game day, but with a tangy and cheesy buffalo flavor, Cheetos Crunchy Buffalo is proud to be the second best buffalo thing. Grab Cheetos Crunchy Buffalo today. McDonald's presents Burger Reviews by Hamburglar, the classic cheeseburger. Hamburglar? Bravo, bravo. He said the patties are juicier than ever before. Bottom up, up, up. Available at most restaurants in this area.